Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord together. It's a beautiful day that God has given to us, and we're so glad that you're here so that we can worship together and praise God together. I want to just highlight a few ministry opportunities. First of all, I hope you all picked up one of the communion cups on the way in. If you did not, now would be a good time to go get that uh, so we can share communion later on in the service. Uh, women, please remember that on May 11th, uh, American Baptist Women is trying to restart after a year or a little more the being off, uh, not being able to gather. So May 11th at 1 o'clock here at the church, if you're able to come for that. Let's at this time go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the life that you've given to us and the joy of being able to gather together today. God, we thank you for this time of worship, this time to praise you, this time to give you glory, and to give you the respect and honor that you deserve. God, we thank you for the many blessings that you give to us and the joy of knowing that you are always with us. We thank you especially for the salvation that you've given to us, the forgiveness of sins and the new life that we receive through Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. But God, we know, even though we have forgiveness and salvation, we do not always live the way you desire us to live. We do not always choose to live like Christ. And so in this moment, we want to examine our own lives and confess our sins.
Praise God. He is above all things. Several weeks ago, I reminded you of the definition of grace. And the definition I gave you was God giving good things to people who don't deserve it. God giving good things to people who don't deserve it. Well, this morning, I want to give you a second word, a related word uh, to this one. In fact, it's kind of like the other side of the coin. One side is grace, on the other hand, side is mercy, as they indeed go hand in hand. And uh, so we're going to look at mercy and its definition. As we think of its definition and grace's definition, we realize that God is in fact the initiator of both. God gives both grace and he also gives mercy. But the definition goes like this, that in fact it's not something God gives, mercy is not something God gives, but in mercy it is something that in fact God withholds. He holds back something. And he holds back, in fact, bad things. So grace is giving good things. Mercy is God withholding bad things. The good things of grace are things like blessings and favor and good pleasure and also forgiveness. The bad things of mercy that he withdraws or withholds is, in fact, his judgment and his punishment. And what happens is that God in mercy withholds these bad things, though, not to people who don't deserve it, but rather to people who do deserve it. And so we see the comparison, but yet we also see that they are related, that in mercy, in giving mercy, God in fact withholds punishment, judgment, bad things from people who in fact deserve those things. <coughs> and in our study of the book of Jonah, we see actually two illustrations of God giving grace and giving mercy. Uh, the first one, of course, is in Jonah himself. Uh, you remember Jonah? As we talked several weeks ago, as we opened our story, Jonah was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh, and he chooses to run the other way. He rebels against God. He runs away from God. He sins. And one of the things that we know from Romans 3.23 is that the excuse me, 6.23, is that the wage of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. So, in fact, when Jonah ran away, he deserved to die. So when he was thrown overboard, he deserved death, because that would be the natural punishment. But God, out of his grace, out of his mercy, provided the fish, spared him his life, and then when Jonah repented, God forgave him, and spit him back out on the dry land. And so God gave Jonah grace and mercy, even before he repented. The second illustration in the book of Jonah, of course, is the Ninevites. The Ninevites were very evil, wicked people. They were a violent people, they were a brutal people, and they also were an idolatrous people. They had many gods. And so it was also, in their rebellion from God, the penalty that they deserved also was death. But God, again, out of his grace, out of his mercy, first of all, <coughs> sent to them Jonah. Jonah to be a prophet. Jonah to proclaim, repent, or you will receive the judgment of God in 40 days. And they did repent. And so God in his mercy and grace also forgave them of their sins. And so it is with us. We are like Jonah. We are like the Ninevites. We too rebel and sin against God. But God has also given to us grace and mercy through the cross and the resurrection. And he has given to us salvation through Christ. And so when we repent and when we turn back to him, he continues to be gracious and merciful and forgives us of all of our sins. And so that is the joy. But the problem for Jonah, of course, was the grace and mercy that God was going to give to Nineveh 
Jonah had a problem with that. So I invite you, <coughs> excuse me, I invite you to turn with me to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, as we look at this part of the story of Jonah. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah understood, as the King James Version puts it, that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. Job was fully aware of God's nature, and that was his fear. When he was commissioned to go to Nineveh, his fear was not that he would go to Nineveh and be killed as an enemy, but his fear was that God would in fact be gracious and merciful to Nineveh, and he did not want that. His prejudice also kicked in. You see, Jonah, along with other Jewish people, believed that God's mercy and grace were only for the Jewish people, and definitely not for the wicked Ninevites, the brutal, violent, idolatrous Ninevites. And so he feared, and his prejudice made him run away from God, because he knew he could not control God. He could not manipulate God. He knew God was gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and he knew he was not going to change God's mind, so he felt the only choice he had was to run away, because you see, his commitment was more to what he believed God should do than God's nature as to what God would do. And what happens in our own lives when we do not get our way, as Jonah did not get his way? We get frustrated. We get angry. Sometimes we get very angry. We sulk. We have adult temper, temper tantrums. We've all seen two-year-old temper tantrums. Some of you have experienced those. And, and the worst <laughs> is not when they're at home, when they're in the grocery store. And you've seen, our kids would never do this, they, they knew better. But you've seen kids actually throw themselves on the floor in a grocery store and have a tantrum. Well, if you think that's bad, adult temper tantrums are even worse. But that's what Jonah had. He was angered, he was frustrated. God did not do what he wanted him to do. And what's amazing, even in his despair and this destructive anger that he had, he was willing once again to die. While he was on the ship, he said, just throw me overboard and let me die. Here, once again, he says to God, I can't take it. I am so angry that you forgave the Ninevites. Just kill me. It is better for me to die than to keep on living and see the forgiveness and grace that you have given to that people. Nevertheless, God's grace and mercy continues for Jonah. We would have given up on Jonah a long time ago, but God continues to be slow to anger and compassionate and grateful. He still wants to kind of bring Jonah along side with him. And he does so by asking him a question. And the question is, have I have one more question. Give me the question. There you go. <laughs> you have any right to be angry. Have you any right to be angry? Jonah hears the question, and he walks away without answer. He goes out of the city, goes to the east side of the city, and builds himself a little shelter, a little lean-to, sits under it because the, the sun is so hot, and he positions himself, though, to look at the city, to peer at the city, to observe the city, probably in hope that he would see the 
Ninevites begin to turn back to their evil ways, and he's just waiting for that to happen, and he's waiting for God to eventually destroy them. God, however, wants to teach him about his mercy, wants to correct him, wants him to bring him back along. And so what God does in his grace and mercy for Jonah, mercy for Jonah he, in fact, provides a vine. A vine grows around this lean to around this shelter, and it's a, probably a very leafy vine, and begins to add more shelter from the blazing sun for Jonah. <laughs> Jonah is excited. He's ecstatic. You know, this is great. More shelter. I'm getting some comfort. He's very happy. But he still hasn't changed his attitude towards the Nineveh and so, as God's way to continue to teach Jonah, he then, in the next morning at dawn, provides a worm. A worm that starts to chew on this vine, and the, the vine indeed withers and the vine dies. And when that happens, the, the wind starts coming in from the east, and the sun becomes more intense. And it gets so hot that Jonah faints from heat exhaustion. And once again, Jonah is angry. He's angry that this vine has now died. And what he says again, a third time, just kill me. It is better off that I just die than continue to live. But you see, God had a lesson. He was trying to teach God, I mean Jonah, about his mercy. And the lesson of the vine that grew, was that, Jonah, you were so happy about that vine that grew. In the same way you should be happy about that vine that grew, that you didn't plant, that you didn't water, that you didn't fertilize, that I provided for you, and you were happy about that vine, so you should also be happy that I am willing to be gracious and merciful to the Ninevites, just as I was gracious and merciful, merciful to you providing this vine. The lesson then of the vine dying is that Jonah, conversely, should have been grieved and sad and mourned if it was necessary for God to destroy Nineveh because they did not repent. But instead, he should rejoice that Nineveh did repent and that God did not destroy them. The bottom line that God wanted to teach Jonah was that he is a merciful and gracious God. And as he said to Moses, recorded in the book of Exodus, God said in verses, yeah, chapter 33, verse 19, I will be merciful on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And God chose that compassion on the people of Nineveh, and they repented, and he was gracious, and he was merciful, and he did not destroy them. And Jonah should have been ecstatic. Sometimes in our own lives, we are like Jonah. We too want God to do things our way. We want to control God. We want to manipulate God. We want to change his mind. We want him to do what we want to do. And so we have this power struggle with God. It's his will against my will. What he wants against what we want. He should do what we, if I was God, I would. And you could fill in the blank. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, who do we resist loving and providing care for that God wants us to? Who do we exclude and judge and keep out of our network of friends? What are our prejudices? We all have prejudices. Yours may not be race or, or nationality, but we all have certain prejudices. What are our prejudices? Who do we find it hard to forgive? Some of these people in these categories are people that maybe they, they don't have our same beliefs, they don't have our same values. Uh, 
They uh, don't live like we do. Some of these individuals are, are people who have maybe hurt us, or maybe they've hurt someone else, someone we love, someone we care for, or they hurt the innocent. Uh, maybe these people are very immoral people, even according to the scripture, not just according to our own standard. Maybe these people are antagonistic to God. Who are our Ninevites? Lloyd Ogilvy, in his commentary on the book of Jonah, wrote this. We play God when we continue to be angry at people and groups, when God has pronounced his forgiveness. We take their punishment into our own hands whether in negative attitudes, vindictive words, or hostile, destructive actions, we run out ahead of God in meeting out what we think justice demands. And he asks, is that your right? The question has only one answer. No, Lord, that is your right, not mine. And so to help us, we need to then evaluate our own walk with Christ. When we were converted, the Holy Spirit transformed us, recreated us, made us new, made us people who desire to be like Christ. How are we doing on that? Are we really allowing God to transform us by the renewing of our mind, by seeking to be more and more like Christ, to send, surrender to His Lordship, on a daily basis to give him our will? Are we really trying to be transformed or are we so willful and saying, no, my will be done? Are we asking God to help us achieve our will as opposed to praying to God and saying to God, not my will, but yours be done. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I will love those who How are we doing? Are we like Jonah? Or are we more like Christ? In conclusion, I want to share with you another part of Lloyd Ogilvie's commentary on Jonah. In fact, it's his final thought. He wrote this. A final thought. Michelangelo's painting on the Sistine Chapel ceiling at the Vatican portrays the prophets, apostles, and patriarchs. Of all the faces he painted, none has a more radiant countenance than Jonah. We don't know what happened after the sudden close of Jonah's biography. Perhaps Michelangelo hoped that Jonah had a radical change and did indeed become a communicator of God's grace and mercy. We do not know. But what we do know is that our own portrait is not finished. And what it will be is dependent on the mercy we receive and the mercy we give away in our name. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this study on the book of Jonah. We thank you for his life. We thank you for what he did do, but God, may we also learn from his mistakes, from the sins that he created. We pray and hope that he did turn around, but God, we know and, and ask that you would help us to remember that you indeed are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and may we truly live according to your will and not our own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I would ask that you would take your communion cup. Indeed, we rejoice for Christ died for all people. He was not selected. He did not die just for the Jews. He did not die just for a certain group of people, a certain social economic area, not a certain ethnic group, not even a certain gender. But he in fact died for all people. So today 
day we celebrate and rejoice in the fact that he died for each one of us in this room. It was on the night that Jesus took the bread, that he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. Let us pray for the cup. Holy God, we thank you and praise you for the joy that we can celebrate and take this bread together, not this cup later, but the bread now. And we thank you that it is a symbol of the body of Jesus the Christ that is broken for us, given to us, died on the cross for us, that we would have life. And so God, we thank you that he did this for each and every one of us because of our sin. And so may we partake with thanksgiving and rejoicing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Christ given to you. After the supper, Jesus also took the cup that was on the table, and he blessed it and gave it to his disciples. Let us pray for the cup. <clears throat> Holy and gracious God, out of your mercy, you also took the cup that was on the table, a, a symbol of Jesus' shed blood. <clears throat> and you said that this was the new covenant in your blood. God, we thank you for the new covenant. A covenant that abolished the sacrificial system. That would tear the curtain in two so that now we have full access to your throne. That would give us the fullness of victory over sin and death. So God, we ask that you would help us to rejoice in you as we partake together. Amen. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink. <clears throat> 